<coughs> yeah, go ahead. Hey, Karthik, how are you doing today? Very good, thank you. Okay, so let's get into this. It's mostly uh, front end questions. So, oh. yeah. So, can you explain um, how HTTPS works? Uh, very, uh, very in I mean make it step by step very detailed explanation is what I'm expecting. Great. So HTTPS is basically just HTTP running on top of TLS. Mm -hmm. And TLS, if you look in the network stack, there's TCP, there's stuff below it. Forget that. Mm -hmm. So there's a transport layer, right? Like TCP right. and newer transport layers. On top of that you have TLS, which makes it secure. Mm -hmm. so when you have TLS, you have a secure transport and you can send any bytes on top of that secure transport. Mm -hmm. And now you send HTTP requests using this secure connection. So no one can see what you are uh, fetching, mm -hmm. what you are seeing. Mm -hmm. No one can modify the data also. Mm -hmm. That's an attacker. So um, our TLS, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, just I've also uh, heard of something called SSL. Are these two the same? SSL is the older version of TLS. I see. So there was like SSL 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and then they started calling it TLS. I see. Got it. Got it. Keep going, cut. And one more thing is that TLS supports different ciphers, which are the things that actually encrypt and decrypt the data. So that way it's a generic and extensible thing. So your mm -hmm. uh, browser and server will talk to each other and each mm -hmm. of them will say, I support ciphers A, B, C and the other will say, I support A, B, D. Mm -hmm. So now the common subset is A and B. So they'll pick one of them. So that way it's like an extensible thing. If a more uh, secure cipher is built tomorrow, we could shift to that. Right. So let me think about what else to talk about HTTP. So you can like start from like why we need this in the first place. And then it obviously uh, does some encryptions and like okay. and handshakes and stuff like that. I am okay. actually kind of giving up, okay. but you can like go on detail on. Cool, cool. So let's see, there are two reasons you want it. One is integrity, one is confidentiality. Integrity means that nobody else should be able to change the message mm -hmm. other than the client and the server. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing an online transfer of let's say 1000 rupees, an mm -hmm. attacker on the network should not be able to change the amount to 10,000 rupees mm -hmm. by you know messing with the packets on the mm -hmm. network. Mm -hmm. Like imagine you're at an airport or coffee shop or some place that is insecure. Right. So that is one thing that is integrity. Now, if you have integrity and no confidentiality, it means it's public, but it can't be changed. Others can see it, but they can't change. That's one type of security. Mm -hmm. And in certain circumstances, that is the appropriate kind of security. So for example, if the government releases a public notification, mm -hmm. nobody else should be able to modify it and claim that the government has released it. But right. it's not secret. In fact, the purpose is to make it available to everyone. So that's a case of co uh, integrity without confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Conversely, confidentiality means people can't even see it. Mm -hmm. And TLS offer or HTTPS offers both. Mm -hmm. What you don't need it for is accidents. Like if there is a memory chip on one of the routers that is corrupt and it's corrupting some packets. Mm -hmm or lightning hits one of the cables through which the data is flowing. Mm -hmm. These kind of accidental things, TCP itself takes care. So we don't need to worry. I see. Now, but if you want confidentiality and uh, integrity, then you need to go with TLS. I see. So does it, like, like you said, it offers privacy and integrity. Uh, does it uh, do identification better than HTTP? 
So HTTP has no identification at all. You just send a message somewhere and you get a response. Right. Someone can reroute it and inject FX server that responds to you. Mm -hmm. So if you are sitting in a coffee shop, right? And right. your browser has no way of knowing who is who. Yeah. Now, so HTTP, plain HTTP doesn't have any of any kind of identity. HTTPS has. So for that, we use certificate authorities. Mm -hmm. So the idea is there are a bunch of trusted companies mm -hmm. whom we trust to identify who is who, and they'll give a certificate. So if you are whatever city bank, you go to a certificate authority and you mm -hmm. get a certificate that says it's that says you are city bank. Mm -hmm. And when you have browser contact, so suppose you type citybank.co.in in your browser. Mm -hmm. Not only does it fetch the data, it also fetches the certificate from the server. And it checks with the certificate authority whether the certificate matches. So let's say an attacker is able to impersonate Citibank using his own server. Mm -hmm. So then the certificate won't match. He'll have his own website certificate. Suppose it is hacker.com. Mm -hmm. Then you'll get an error in your browser saying you are going to Citibank.in, but the certificate is from hacker.com and your browser will refuse to load the page. So this validation is done by the certificate authority, is it? Yes, there's a chain of trust using signatures. Uh -huh. So basically, when you when you say chain of trust, it means A trusts B and B trusts C. So that uh -huh. way, A implicitly trusts C. You don't need to explicitly do that. So because there are millions of websites, so the browsers cannot possibly hard code all of them, right? So they hard code the certificate authorities. Uh -huh. So basically, what happens is the uh, website presents a certificate to the browser, mm -hmm. which is cryptographically signed by the certificate authority, which no one else can sign. Mm -hmm. And the browser has a certificate authority's key. So that way it establishes the chain of trust. Right, got it. Now, got. there are different types of certificates. There's extended validation certificates, EV certificates, where they check not just that you own the website, but they also check that you are that company. So for example, Citibank in this example, they, they have an EV certificate. Mm -hmm. And in the browser, it shows Citibank India rather than citibank.co.in. So it's like an extended validation. It's not just testing that the, it's not just verifying that the website is citibank.in, mm -hmm. but the company in the real world is Citibank India. Mm -hmm. Got it, got Actually, it. Sometimes in the browser address bar, you see the name of a company, not just a, a domain name. Makes sense. So let's see what else is there. Um, we talked about TLS. We talked so about you mentioned that certificate authority signs it via encryption. Yeah. Uh, are there any like general algorithms used? And if so, can you like go on a bit about them? Like go on a bit details about them? Like what kind of encryption? The main um, algorithm is called public key encryption. Mm -hmm. Sometimes called as PKI. Mm -hmm. So the basic thing is this algorithm has a private key and a public key. Now, mm -hmm. the way the algorithm works is information that is signed is information that is encrypted using one of the keys can be decrypted only by the other key. Mm -hmm. So basically, and, and in cryptography, the conventional names used are Alice and Bob. Those are the two parties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, If Alice and Bob are talking to each other, mm -hmm. Alice has a public key and a private key. Bob has a public key and a private key. Mm -hmm. Let's say Alice sends a message to Bob. Mm -hmm. She signs it with her private key, which as the name says, she doesn't share with anyone else because that is her identity. That's like a password. Right. And she has a public key, which she shares with everyone. Mm -hmm. So when she sends a document to Bob, Bob mm -hmm. encrypts it using Alice's public key. 
Mm-hmm. And the decryption will succeed only if it was encrypted with her private key in the first place. So right. that way, Bob is able to verify that it came from Alice. Mm-hmm. Without, uh, knowing that, without knowing Alice's private key, mm-hmm. which she cannot share with Bob, because if she did, now Bob can sign other documents claiming to be Alice. Right. So this is the basic uh, fundamental of. Uh, PKI, public key infrastructure. So uh-huh. the way this is used is the certificate authority uh-huh. signs a document saying that uh-huh. this document is called a certificate. It, it issues a certificate saying that Citibank India uh-huh. is a verified company and they own the domain citibank.co.in and they sign uh-huh. it with their private key. And they give that certificate to Citibank, which Citibank will install on their web server, which will serve it to everybody. So mm-hmm. now your browser will decrypt it using the certificate authority's public key. And okay. now that if the decryption succeeds, it could have been issued only by the certificate authority because no one else has a certificate authority's private key. Right. So that is okay. how the security works. So, uh, so in your example, Alice actually decrypted, sorry, encrypted a message using her private key and sent the public key to Bob, right? Yes. So if someone else gets hold of that public key, then they can also decrypt Alice's message, right? Correct. So uh, I, in at that time, it's literally pointless having this encryption, right? So are there any measures? I mean, yeah. do we have to take any measures for that or this, how is that handled? Right. So again, when we talk about security, we should always talk about the threat model. If you talk to a security engineer and you ask, is this secure? He'll say that's a vague question. Tell me the threat model. The threat model are what are the things you're concerned about? Mm -hmm. For example, the kind of encryption or security you and I use may be different Mm -hmm. from that used by an FBI agent operating in some other country, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because governments are not trying to hack us. Governments are trying to hack him. Right. So in this example, which I told you, we are talking about integrity, but not confidentiality. So let's say Alice is the government. They're issuing Mm -hmm. a public statement. Mm -hmm. So they don't care about confidentiality in this particular case. So that's Mm -hmm. one example. The other thing is you can encrypt it twice, once to ensure confidentiality, once to uh, ensure integrity. So for example, the government, if it wants to issue a notification, first Mm -hmm. it it can encrypt it with its private key and put it up on its server. Everyone knows the government's public key, so they can decrypt it and they can verify that it is indeed encrypted by the government. That is one case. Mm -hmm. That's a case of an integrity, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not uh, confidentiality. (coughs) If you want confidentiality, um, the case we talked about, right? Yeah. So, you know, where Alice has encrypted with uh, Bob's private key and then sent it to Bob. Now, only Bob can decrypt it because only Bob Sorry, Alice encrypts a document with Bob's public key right. and sends it to Bob. Only Bob can decrypt it because he has his private key. Nobody else does. Right. So even if somebody made a copy of the data by tapping into the network cables or whatever, right, they can't do anything with it. So this is a case of confidentiality. But God. Alice is not guaranteed to be the center of the message. And there's no way for Bob to know because anybody could have sent a message to Bob. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you don't have the integrity. Mm -hmm. In that case, you do the double encryption. So first, Alice takes the message, signs Mm -hmm. it with a private key, Mm -hmm. then signs or encrypts it with with a private key, then encrypts it with Bob's public key, then sends it to Bob. Mm -hmm. And Bob undoes the encryption twice with two different keys. Got Yes, yes, makes sense. That makes sense. And yeah, I think we, we covered almost everything on yes. how HTTPS works. Except handshake, did we talk about that? 
No. I mean, we talked about it implicitly. I can just. Yeah. Yeah. So handshake is when both parties tell what kind of security ciphers they support. That's right. So for example, I give one one party says I support A B C, the other says A B D. So they pick uh -huh. between A and B, and there's yeah. a priority order also. So yeah. A will say I support A B C. I mean, not A. One of the parties will say I support A B C. Uh -huh. I really prefer B. Then uh -huh. I prefer A. Then I prefer C. So like this, some priority order will be set up. So first you will find what works for both parties. Then among uh -huh. the common subset, you go in the priority order and you pick the first one. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. Now, I have another question, which is a bit technical. Technical in the sense, it's a it's a very basic question. So, how would you hide a div? Like, you have a what? div, div like a div or a section of a HTML page. Mm hmm. You are told to hide something, yeah. right? Like, how do you go about it in code? Couple of ways you can do it. One is you can set display none, mm -hmm. or you can set visibility hidden. Mm -hmm. The difference between the two, I forget which is which, but one of them leaves mm -hmm. a blank space in the UI where that element is supposed to be there. The other removes the blank space. So if you have A, B, C, and B has mm -hmm. this tag. Then mm -hmm. there'll be a, there'll be a blank space, then there'll be c. Mm -hmm. Got it. That is one thing. There are various other tricks you can do. If it has only text, you could possibly set the text color and the background color the same, but still the user can select it with the mouse. Uh huh. So depending on which way you want to hide it, you know there are different ways of doing it. Right. So let's 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 talk about the first. Way you said, like the first two, basically mm -hmm. uh, display none and visibility. Uh, apart from what you said about one of them being, you know, showing an empty space, mm -hmm. are there any other reasons you should go with one or the other? Like, for example, perf like specifically performance related stuff. My guess, and this is just a guess is that the thing that does not leave the blank space will be faster because the browser engine doesn't need to calculate how much blank space needs to be left. It will be as if it's not in the DOM at all. So my guess is that will be faster. Yes, yes, makes sense. You're right. Uh, it's actually uh, display none will actually uh, let the browser recompute the page and also paint, uh, but visibility will just, uh, just a repaint is enough when you set visibility hidden, which is more performance. I mean, which is better in terms of performance because the browser, browser doesn't need to do computation. Um, and talking about performance, uh, what are some strategies to, you know, improve Page speed in the front oh. end specifically. Right, whole bunch of them. I'll just mm -hmm. say them in no particular order. One Got is it. you can use a CDN, mm -hmm. a Kamaya, whichever it is, which will be faster. Can you like go on and explain why that is faster as well? Like, what does it do differently? So, yeah, so basically, a CDN is a network of servers that has a presence in every city of the world. And they are in all the major ISPs networks. Mm -hmm. So it'll be faster, right? So if you are using mm -hmm. whatever ACT broadband, they'll mm -hmm. have a direct connection rather than going over the public internet. Mm -hmm. So, and it's also geographically distributed. So mm -hmm. the idea is that if you are the publisher, mm -hmm. whenever you push out a new version, it gets copied to all the servers, like whatever, 700 or how many ever there are all over the world. Mm -hmm. And then each person retrieves it from the closest server. So that's a CDN, mm -hmm. mostly used for static content like images and videos and so on. Mm -hmm. Gigantic sites like YouTube have their own in-house CDN, but most other people use one of the existing CDNs. Mm -hmm. That is one approach. Another approach is to avoid unnecessary script tags. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that is one because each of them has a delay. So if you're loading whatever, right? 10 MB of data using 10 HTTP requests. That is better than loading it over 100 HTTP requests. So you, know, you should do things like combine scripts and so on. Got it. Got that it. is one thing. But there are some situations in which you don't want to combine scripts, you want to split them. So if there is some functionality that only some people use, mm -hmm. let's say on YouTube, there is a functionality to flag a comment as inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Let's say only 1% of people use that. Mm -hmm. JavaScript for that can load only when the user clicks that UI element. So that is a approach in which you don't want to combine scripts. So that is one thing. The other mm -hmm. thing is in the DOM, you have async and defer tags, mm -hmm. which kind of delay the, I mean, so if you don't use this, what happens is when the browser encounters the script tag, it mm -hmm. stops and fetches it and only then proceeds. Mm -hmm. Whereas these two things let it happen in parallel. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you there are many tools like Google Page Speed and others which give mm -hmm. you a score along with data and they'll give you prioritized recommendations, right? They'll group it into three categories like green, orange, and red, where red are really bad. Orange need to be improved, but you can do it later. Green are good. That is mm -hmm. one. Thing. The other thing is you should support newer versions of protocols like HTTP and whatever, right? HTTP two is faster than one and three is even faster. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you should load images at the right resolution. Right. For example, don't serve a 12 megapixel image unless needed. Right, like, right. Like in a news yeah. article, make them click it, then serve the full version. That right. is one. Um, one more thing is if you're updating the DOM a lot, use a virtual DOM since that's faster and the DOM updates are minimized. Another technique is if you have something that's uh, like- can, can, can you please repeat the last point? I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. So in some situations, it helps to use a virtual DOM like Vue or React. Uh -huh. And the situation is in which you are making a lot of small changes to the DOM regularly. Then you should use a virtual DOM. Right. If you are doing it only occasionally, like I don't know, once in ten seconds or so, it's not a problem. Yes, got it. That is one more technique. The other technique is to use modern image and video formats. For example, you should use VP9 for video. Mm -hmm. if possible. But it right. doesn't support all the browsers, right? Like Safari does Safari support VP9? The newest version of it introduced last year does. Okay. Okay. But then again, you still make a valid point. So if you do this, you'll end up serving different versions of it. So mm -hmm. this applies to videos, it applies to audio. It applies to images also. So that is one more technique. Let's see what else. Um, okay, we're in CSS. Yeah, of course you should minify your JS to reduce the size. Mm -hmm. If you have something extremely CPU intensive, you should use WebAssembly or something. Mm -hmm. And um, one second, let me see what else I can think of. I've covered media. I've covered the network layer by mm -hmm. talking about CDNs and HTTP versions. Oh yeah, you should set the caching headers appropriately so that the browser can cache your stuff. Mm -hmm. And one technique that is used in caching is I mean, it's a bit of a second level detail. We don't need to get into it, but uh, yeah, you can basically set the expiry to forever and change the URL. So that could be one more thing to do. Uh, the other thing is you can use CSS sprites. If you have a lot of small icons, like save and mm -hmm. copy, mm -hmm. and paste, and a whole bunch of small icons. If you load them as separate images, then you have to go to the network for each of them. With a sprite, you load one big image and then mm -hmm. you specify a sub rectangle within it. Mm -hmm. That is one. The other thing is, of course, you shouldn't do things like display images containing only text. You should use a table or something. So, suppose you are trying to compare the pros and cons of whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Two different options. Maybe you're a mm -hmm. financial advisor, you're, you're you know, comparing two different financial investments. Mm -hmm. 
you shouldn't take a screenshot you should put it as a html table or something mm -hmm. because that is much smaller and clearer and readable and you know it works with accessibility so that is one um you should test with multiple browsers of course make sure it's fast in all of them the other thing is you should just if possible simplify the page visually also that many of these news sites and all have all kinds of junk right mm -hmm. you shouldn't do that one is because it makes a reading experience bad mm -hmm. but also all of these things need time to load right so i think i covered everything that came like if i think more i'll get more but I guess i can stop here unless you have yes, yes. you have uh, almost covered everything that i had in mind as well cool uh okay so yeah i think that is all yeah one more question so why do you like why why do you think react became so popular like there are like better or better like very i mean very many alternatives to that but still the community on react is very big and do you have any thoughts or opinions on that like this is just an open ended question so there's no right or wrong right i i haven't used react but i'll tell you what i know they are the ones who started this whole virtual dom thing Mm -hmm. So one benefit of React is you don't need to track data dependencies in any app. Mm -hmm. You have some model layer objects in the MVC paradigm, and you have a bunch of views. Mm -hmm. Now each of these views may depend on multiple model layer objects. Mm -hmm. So you have to track the dependency. Right. So for example, in a camera app, as you pinch to zoom, the zoom mm -hmm. label should get updated. Mm -hmm. Once the zoom label is updated, let's say to five x, your pinch to zoom. Then, if you tap the zoom label, the zoom should reset. Mm -hmm. So now there are three different things that need to be kept in sync. One is the gestures, mm -hmm. the other is a label, and the third is the actual camera. Right. Now, if either of these get out of sync, it's a problem. If mm -hmm. the label isn't updating, then it looks like the label is frozen. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if the camera isn't updating, then you have a beautiful UI, but the actual camera part isn't working. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. tracking these dependencies, it becomes an M by N problem. Mm -hmm. If you have M views and N model layer objects, mm -hmm. huge amount of time goes into all of these things mm -hmm. because the model layer objects have to have listeners, the views have to register as a listener. then the model layer whenever it changes it has to update the view and sometimes you get false updates like you get an update but actually nothing has changed okay. which hurts performance and uh, if the view code doesn't handle it it can cause a bug or a crash or an exception so this entire problem react solves and it solves it by using a functional paradigm instead of an object oriented paradigm Mm -hmm. It is to say, I mean, I do know that you have class-based uh, components and uh, right. components. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is at at the simplest layer, simplest level, you have mm -hmm. a function, right? And it mm -hmm. takes the entire model as an argument. You have one giant render function for your entire app. Mm -hmm. It has an argument. You can think of it as a JSON or nested objects in JavaScript or whatever. Mm -hmm. it takes one argument which is the entire model layer all the model layer object state is combined into one mm -hmm. and it is given to this function now and it uh, the output of this function is a virtual dom mm -hmm. so react sto stores the copy of that virtual dom somewhere mm -hmm. then when any of the inputs changes you tell react to re-render the whole virtual dom so you have mm -hmm. data one which when you invoke this function results in view one mm -hmm. then you have data two mm -hmm. which when you invoke this function results in view two mm -hmm. then react diffs view one and view two it finds out which elements have changed mm -hmm. 
and it updates the DOM with it. Mm -hmm. So now the advantage is you don't need to track the dependencies. So for example, if you have an app that has a profile, mm -hmm. take something like Amazon. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's mm -hmm. say one of the model layer objects is your name and your name appears somewhere or multiple times in the UI. Mm -hmm. So let's say at the top left, it says, welcome Ajo. Mm -hmm. And at the top right, it says, not Ajo, log out. Mm -hmm. And when you go to the orders page, it says Ajo's orders. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple places in the UI where your name is repeated. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose you go to the profile and change your name. Mm -hmm. With React, you don't have to keep track of where all your name is appearing. Everything gets re-rendered. Mm -hmm. So that right. is a huge advantage. And this uh, diffing algorithm, this virtual DOM diffing algorithm, mm -hmm. there was a PhD thesis written by an Australian okay. guy, if I remember, Andrew Tridgell or someone. And he is the guy who came up with an efficient algorithm. Until then, this was just a theory. You could do it, but it was so inefficient that you practically couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. With true. this thing, it was possible. So basically, performance, simplicity. You don't need to track all these dependencies and have all these listeners and callbacks and all of this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is my understanding. Right. Yep. That that was good, right? Ah, uh, you get that, the guy. Yeah, we can stop recording now. Yeah. Before that, what is your assessment? Oh, uh, you have answered. Like, I only have a bunch of questions, and you have answered them all well. I think the only thing I would have done better is so uh, uh, for my first question of what is HTTP, I mean, how does HTTPS work? You could have like, um, you know, organized it a bit better because oh. we, we kind of went back and forth like about things. Oh. So I was expecting like a step by step, like, why do we need this? What kind of encryption do we do? Then what's the next step like handshake and then like it would have been a little more uh clearer then for someone who is listening for the first time or, or someone yeah. who doesn't know right otherwise you have like give uh answered all the answers properly uh oh, sorry all the questions appropriately uh and given me answers what i was expecting and more so that's the plus and Yes, Karthik, that's, that's my overall feedback. Awesome. Should I stop recording? Yes, Karthik, stop.